I am really pleased to introduce a film and a filmmaker tonight, that both of which I admire very, very much. Before we actually bring the director into full focus on Zoom, we're going to see a trailer from his film, Leap. It is the Chinese submission for the Oscars this year, and it is uh, centered around the story of the Chinese volleyball coach, Long Ping. Let's take a look at the trailer first. We can't play a whole day. Did you ever think about being the main female female? Actually, from that time, you should know that we will meet soon. We can't get rid of it. Come on. I've got nothing to say. What do we need to do now? 该做的事，一分一分给我把球咬回来。Show me what you've got. Yeah! 咱都三十年朋友了，就一天是对手。我十六岁进的排球队，这墙上呢，每一个球印啊，就是以前那帮傻姑娘一个球一个球给凿出来。那时候我们打球，那真的是什么都没有。但我们心里边有这个。你有我心肝的，可是他们不信呢。他们说我们永远高不过俄罗斯，也跳不过巴西，也没有塞尔维亚跟意大利的力量。现在你能给大家带来展示的希望。我郎平从来不装，我都是玩真格的。排球不只是我们的工作。是我们生命的全部。我不管别人还需不需要中国女孩，我需要。Behind all that is the amazing director Peter Hosen Chan. Hello, Peter. Hi, Janet. So Peter is a director I have known about and admired for many years, well before I met him, which is. Some time ago, he was—he's、uh, quite an international filmmaker in that. Grew up in Hong Kong, lived also in Thailand for a number of years, studied in the United States, even made a film in Hollywood. He was plucked out of a relative oblivion by Steven Spielberg and made a film with his with Steven's wife Kate Capshaw. The film that just stunned me and many others, having won so many awards, was your film *Comrades*, almost a love story. But Peter has gone on to make so many different kinds of films: adventure films, musicals, dramas, comedies. In addition, Peter has produced tons of other people's movies. Discovered filmmakers, worked in Thailand, produced horror movies. So I'm quite envious of you, Peter, because I find it very difficult to just do one job well, which is producing. You manage to write, direct, and produce. You wear so many hats, and you are a true international citizen. I just want you to talk a little bit about how you arrived at this place where you can straddle so many different worlds. I think it's a matter of necessity.、Um... To me, producing and trying to put on different hats is always something for me to protect my job as a director and to、um, ensure that I could have the freedom、uh, to make what I want to make when I come back to the job that I really love most, which is directing. And as a filmmaker, you need to have your team around you. When you need to, when you need to build a team, you need to be a producer, and you need to. To work with different talents, sometimes to learn and sometimes to、uh, to strengthen your position in in the、uh, in the industry, and I think it's is not different from anywhere else.、Uh, I think we're a little bit more、uh, blessed in a way where the studio system is not as 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 firm、uh, or tight as as Hollywood, where we are able to make films still pretty much as independent producer or director. Very much like invented film,、uh, even within the industry、uh, in Hong Kong or China now, for that matter. And、uh, and I think I'm kind of blessed, and also because I've moved around a lot when I was younger, so that makes my 
communication skills, uh, working with people from different countries, including the US or uh, Thailand, Korea, when I was working with the Pan-Asian film industry, it, uh, it made more sense for me and it was uh, a bit less barrier for me, uh, language-wise, or in terms of uh, trying to communicate with different people. So I ended up um, have, having a career that is pretty hard to define because you really don't know who I am with the different hats that I've been wearing. And you also don't know where I'm from because I'm from everywhere. Exactly, exactly. And I think, it, I, I suppose one could think that was a handicap, but I think in your case, you've made it a real asset because you have made films that have been blockbusters in China, you've made large films, you've made small films. So I, I just find that very admirable. And, and I do believe that there's probably more freedom in Asia to not be pegged to be one kind of filmmaker. Um, but yeah, how, how do you assess the different markets? Because when I've talked to you in the past, you have a really strong understanding of the different marketplaces. And just, uh, you know, I, I really want to talk primarily about Leap, but uh, and we will in just a second, but how do you assess what market you want to go to with what film? Do you, do you start with that or do you start with the project and then figure out where it should go? Or do you say, oh, this is the market that could really be exploited well? As much as you want to start with a strategy in terms of where is more lucrative to do business, but you always really start with a film because uh, first and foremost, you're still a filmmaker. And all the other business effect, uh, business side of it, um, in effect, is really because you want to make better films and you want to make good films and you, you want to discover new talents or you want to try to reinvent yourself in some way. So no matter how I approach my, my craft or my business, ultimately, it is you can't really plan it. You really have to find the right project that you really have to do. And then the project will lead you to wherever you are. Well, I'm sure many filmmakers thank you for supporting and for being a mentor and producing their projects and helping bring emerging talent to the fore. So for yourself, as of some time ago, I have observed as many people have that you've really been focusing on the China market. And uh, there, uh, there are many, many wonderful stories to come out of China, but this particular story that you chose about Longping, this Chinese champion volleyball player who amazingly then was hired by the American team, brought the American team to its gold, and then went back to China, did the same for the Chinese team. This is a truly fascinating story. Why did you want to make this? Well, first of all, I think the Chinese women's volleyball um, team and their history in the last 40 years has been amazing. They have had a, an, an incredible ride. And um, it also coincide with the uh, economic reform and the open door policy that started in the late seventies in China. So it was not just a movie about volleyball. It was not just a movie about sports, it's, but it's really a movie about how China evolves and changed in the last 30 odd, 40 years. And uh, to me, it's always fascinating to hear stories about China in the 80s um, when everything became possible. Uh, China's gone through a lot of uh, hardships in, uh, in the past and all of a sudden the world has changed. To me, I always uh, equate that with, um, with another era that I've never been able to live through, which is the 60s in, in the West or in the US where everything changes. Um, so to me, I, I always wanted to capture the essence of the 80s and I will always want to be able to recreate that and see it on screen. Uh, but more important than that, uh, somehow in the center of the last 35, 40 years of volleyball history in China was Lang Ping. And the character just calls for a movie. Uh, because her, I mean, her ride and 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 her career was so distinguished and at the same time so dramatic. She was 
the most valuable players, one of the top players in the world. Uh, and as you know, volleyball was totally not a, a, a Chinese sport to start with. It was dominated by uh, the U.S. teams and, you know, the great U.S. players and um, Japanese and Cuban and Serbia and Russia. Uh, by no way was China counted as one of the top teams of the world. And, but they made it to the championship in 1981 with Long Ping as in the center as a players. And she actually won three titles, three world champion titles in the 80s with the Chinese women's volleyball team. And then she immigrated to the U.S. She moved to the U.S. And then she lived in the U.S. and ultimately became the U.S. coach and took the U.S. team and came back to China in 2008 and beat the Chinese team uh, in the Beijing Olympics in 2008. And that was very controversial for Chinese because there we are, a Chinese coach, but she led the U.S. team and she beat the Chinese team. And then she went back to the US and ultimately was summoned back to China and became the Chinese coach in 2013. And then she took the Chinese team back to the top in, Rio, in the Rio games in 2016. So her whole trajectory of her career was something that was almost like fictional. It was like, it was like all written. I mean, it was too, too, too perfect a story. <laughs> Dramatic to be, to be, to be, yeah. but, but it's the fact. So, I mean, and, and, and then I got, I got uh, during our script, um, you know, doing our research, I got to meet Lang Ping and we had length, lengthy interviews with her uh, and discussions. And, and I find that she's really a very charismatic character. She is uh, so independent and so, determined in what she wants to do. And she works within the system, within the establishment in China, within the politics of China. But at the same time, she, she was the one that managed to do things her own way. So in a way, she is a very charismatic and individualistic character in a very collective society. So I, I think that in itself is, is something that is very unique in, in China or in Asia or anywhere in the world for that matter. So, so we, we found this perfect character and this perfect story to make a movie out of. Mm -hmm. uh, you've said so many things and I wanna break them down a little bit. So you talk about how this story of Lang Ping in some ways reflects the story of China over 30 years. We've talked about how special the 80s were, as, as, as you know, and others know, I, I lived in Beijing in the early 80s. And, and many of us who lived there at the time felt feel so nostalgic about that period. I, I don't think I will ever experience that again, the level of purity in a way, the innocent, and this feeling of hope and curiosity about the rest of the world was truly a special time. How would you describe the evolution of China in these 30 years, starting with that period in the 80s, which you've heard so much about and recreated so perfectly, so perfectly. It brought back so many memories for me and I'm sure will for others. I, I had a lot of help. As you know, I envy you, um, Janet, for having lived through that, that time. I, I was, I've never set foot in the mainland until 1993. So all I've heard, you know, in my last 20 years of working with China uh, was how beautiful it was in the 80s. And um, through the film, I, I actually get to experience it a bit. You know, we recreated everything that we could. Uh, we had uh, our DP and production designer who lived through those periods and, and, and would uh, give me all their, their contribution in trying to recreate as much as possible what the 80 looked like. And, and I think the most important thing to me is the spirit of the people in the 80s when, when they were so hungry to be, to be seen by the world and how they re-engage 
change uh, how China re-engaged with the world in the 80s. And, um, but at the same time, I, I think there is, what we're trying to do in the film is to show the difference between the 80s and also uh, now, you know, because certainly there are changes in values and sensibilities. And um, as much as people are working as a whole, uh, because they were really eager to be seen uh, as Chinese uh, to the world, then you have that sense of nationalism or, or patriotism or pride to be Chinese uh, in the 80s. But at the same time, when you're dealing with uh, the national team players today who are born mostly in the late 80s or even in the early 90s, and then you see this new generation of kids having very individual thinking. And, um, you know, when they play volleyballs, they don't play with the same sense of of uh, 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 of the the players in the '80s, so you need to deal with the difference between now and then, and and I think that is uh, self-explanatory in the film when you see the film. So um, I I think that was also something that we need to deal with the different sensibility between the the players in the '80s and the players today. Mm-hmm. So you said you spent uh, a good amount of time with Long Ping. And she is very charismatic. What did you learn from her about whether she felt conflicted in her heart about working for an American team or, you know, and then she goes back to China and she has a daughter that she was raising in America for a time, who, by the way, plays her uh, in her younger years. That is just the most amazing coincidence. What, what else did you learn that helped inform you in making the film? Well, one of the things that, that Long Ping taught me was the spirit of uh, winning uh, or the spirit of the Chinese women's volleyball. It's not just about, you know, because when you see all the matches, I think there, it's, it's really perfect to make a sports movie with, uh, with the women's volleyball team in China because they're never the strongest team. They never appears to be the strongest team. So um, they usually lose their first set or two set, and then they would win back at the end. It's, it's, It's almost like catching up at the end. So you're always rooting for them. They would never walk on set and is this best almighty team that nobody would beat. They're always the underdogs. And, um, and, Long Ping's words to me was the spirit of of the women's volleyball team in China is not that they think they'll win every time, but they would fight until their, you know, their last breath. So that in essence is, I mean, because in China, everybody talks about the spirit of the women's volleyball team as if this is like the Chinese spirit, uh, and and I think what is significant about about their their winnings was not because they're the strongest team, it's because they would never lose. They would never accept losing. So to a certain extent, they're not this this de- destined to win, but they they just won't accept losing. That is fascinating. In some ways, it is easier to come in as the underdog because yeah. you've got the the extra motivation. And, and did she feel it was different working with the American team that because they were more on top of the heap that it was, a, did she have a different coaching style or I, I'm just curious how she might've compared the two experiences. I, we didn't get into the, um, the uh, psych in working with the American team, but I'm sure that with her experience uh, working with the American team. And she also coached in Italy. She coached in a lot of different places. She actually speaks fluent Italian. Uh, she coached in Italy for a few years. And, uh, and, and I think that when she came back to coach the Chinese team in 2013, she had the experience of worth working with young players all over the world. So uh, the way she coached, as you see in the second half of the film is obviously very different with the way the old coach used to coach her when she was younger because uh, the national spirit, uh, it was totally different. You know, it's, it's, it's not the same China 
when she came back to. So to that extent, I think uh, I hope that the film actually uh, has a has a, a very uh, clear or thorough uh, evaluation, a perspective of what China was and what China is today. Mm -hmm. I was so thrilled when uh, I heard the announcement that this is the film that China was submitting for the Oscars, because so often they submit films that don't seem necessarily that they will catch on. This one has an immediate relevance. And uh, there's so many fascinating aspects of the filmmaking that will attract an audience because just watching this, the exciting sports scenes, you know, the volleyball itself is very, very exciting. But I think it's a, it's a glimpse, you know, I'm always trying to humanize the representation of Asians on screen. And I think this does that in droves. And I think many people will be able to relate to the players and the artists and their, their injuries. And, you know, you talk about how you brought in the, that you had the floorboards from the 80s and all the exact equipment. And I think it's, it's a, a great portrayal, as you say, of a country, of a team, of a person, all of it. And, and the, you know, in, in a way that's just very human and very relatable. So what, what for you was, that, that was my takeaway. What for you were the most gratifying things about making this film? Uh, again, it was really about living through the last 35 years uh, in two and a half hours. Uh, I think uh, for me, it took us months and months of research and uh, uh, years, a couple of years of screen, script development and uh, ultimately the production, uh, we were so blessed with the fact that we've gotten so many uh, real things, uh, including the players. The players in the 80s were all real athletes that we have recruited from out of 2,000 odd uh, different uh audition different players who have never had any acting experiences, uh, but they were real players. So they all play with conviction and ultimately getting the national team to play for us and getting Lydia uh, by Long, Long Ping's daughter to play her mother was also a magical experience because to her, it's her conviction in proving to her mom that she's one of the best volleyball players, you know, Today, even, you know, she, she plays volleyball herself in Stanford. And then... Was she uh, coached by her mom growing up? Sorry? Was she coached by her mom growing up? No, she was not coached by her mom growing up. She found volleyball herself and uh, she became a volleyball, very established volleyball player. But she was advised not to get into professional volleyball when she graduated college because her mom see how difficult that path was going to be. Mm. And I think to her that uh, is, has always been something that uh, a missing piece in her life mm. that she felt like uh, she was not good enough. And uh, to her, uh, I think this film was her statement uh, to prove to her mom that she could be. Uh, better, or, or 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 at least she could could be closer to her mom uh, in playing that too. So, because I remember scenes where she would she would um, she would disagree with my some of my direction, and she would come to me and said, "You know what? I think my mom wouldn't do this on set. I no. think she, she would do this." Yeah, because there was a scene that where I thought she should tear up or cry. And she said, you know what, my mom would probably run out of the stadium and she would cry outside. She wouldn't cry here. You know, so it was a very strange experience that when we were doing a film, it almost felt like a documentary. And uh, and especially with the second half where we had the whole national team playing for us, they were using their own dialogues, their own lines, and they're because they're actually not acting, they're reenacting. Uh, what they have done before a few years ago. And, uh, and to the detail of the props and the stuff we used in the 80s, we, we actually were very lucky to be able to use the exact floorboards that uh, of the O Stadium, where the O team, where the team, the champions team in the 80s played and practiced. Uh, they were tearing down the O Stadium 
as we were starting production. So we shipped all the wood and the floorboard from the old stadiums uh, from the southern China to Beijing. So uh, the shiny surface of the old stadium were not shined by, by, you know, it was really the sweat and the blood and, the, you know, where all the players were rolling on the old floorboards when you know, with the same splinters and everything. So everything was was very authentic. So when you walk on set uh, during the whole production, we always often have goosebumps on, on us because it felt like we're really living their, you know, the story. We're really living the, the, the truth and the fact. And I, I think that is my point. That's what I loved about it. It's very raw. You have everybody stripped down to, you know, it's a, a very primal level because they're, they're just trying to hit the ball, you know, win the game yeah. or whatever. And, uh, and they and, you know, like so many sports, and for some reason, I felt it more watching this than and many others. The, the pain, the injuries, you know, are were, are so close to the surface, and uh, so you feel it on a very visceral level. Um, you managed to get China's probably China's biggest star. I would say she has been been that for many people for many years. Uh, a, a and just an iconic actress. She's done so much incredible work. And of course, I'm speaking here for me. How was that process? How did you convince her to do it? Or maybe you didn't need to convince her. Maybe she wanted to. And, and what was it like working with her? You know, the first person that came to mind to play Long Ping, the minute we decided that we we're going to make this movie was Gong Li. And um, I called her even before we had a synopsis. I mean, when we had nothing, when I decided to, okay, this is my next film. I called her and then um, we met like within a few days, you know, I flew down to her set when she was doing another movie and uh, I met her in the hotel coffee shop and then she turned me down right there. <laughs> and um, she turned me down and she said, not that she didn't want to play this, but uh, there's, way too much uh, baggage and pressure uh, in playing Lamping because Lamping is such a household name in China that uh, to be able to to convince the audience that she's Lamping would be an impossibility. Mm. And um, she she said um, she would uh, I I would you know I would be better off looking for someone else and uh, if I really can't think of anyone else then when I have to script then I should come back to her. Obviously, I did not give up and I went back to her three times, and every single time I told her all you needed to do is to come on set and just be there uh, and put on the right hair and makeup and trust me you'll be lumping. Nobody would doubt. Because I don't think I can find anyone else that I, I could convince the audience uh, to to buy into the fact that uh, this actress can pull off as lumping. Uh, to me, Gong Li and lumping are very similar. Uh, Gong Li is the entertainment uh, uh, industry's name card, Chinese name card to the world. And lumping is a sports um Chinese name cards to the world. And they both uh, were born in the 60s and they were both uh, one of the first Chinese women to be recognized by the world. And they, I think she has a very similar stature as Long Ping. And she has that presence and that command of the audience that I think all she needed to do is to stand there and don't even, she doesn't even need to act. Um, I just thought that there is no one else that I could convince the audience that uh, she has that presence of long pain. And uh, obviously, Gong Li is not just going to buy into that. So when we got our first draft written, I sent it to her. She came back with a lot of notes and we work with, um, well, actually we worked in LA because she was uh uh, in LA doing post for Mulan. So we worked in LA for a whole week on the script uh, with the screenwriter. And, um, and we went through every single scene. 
And finally, when decided when she decided that she would do the movie, and she went back to China, and she was, uh, she spent a month uh, touring with the volleyball team, mm -hmm. and uh, using her little notebook and jot down all the notes of Long Ping's um, gestures and how she walks and how she talks and how she uh, give her thumbs up to the players. So she learned every little detail of Lang Ping. And uh, when our first trailer came out uh, in China, uh, it was all over the internet. Uh, people were like shocked that how similar Gong Li and Lang Ping looked like and uh, how similar Gong Li, you know, how Gong Li walks like Lang Ping. And her shoulder would crouch back uh, like Lang Ping. Because Lang Ping has multiple injuries. So the way she walks was very, very different. Uh, and um, Gong Li learned every single thing. So uh, she did her job. She did her work. She did a lot of um, uh, research, a lot of hard work. And, uh, and the result is it's, it's amazing. Well, you really called it because... I, I, I agree that she didn't really have to do much. She didn't have to be that physical, but in her face, you see so much, so much. You see the compassion or you see the disappointment or you see that, you know, there's so much depth and gravitas in, in her face. Still, we've never seen Gong Li in a role like this. You know, we associate her with maybe playing a, a, you know, in a period movie, the, the old yeah. Johnny Mo movies or the delicate this or the wife or the bereaved or this whatever we, we all know all the different roles that that uh, Gong Li has played this one is is so different and it was a bit of a shock to see her in the wig and you know in her sports attire uh but it seemed so fitting when you say she went around and toured the different sports teams did she do that with Long King or did she see footage because no, she was with Lang. Gestures. Oh, with Lang Ping. I see. She was with a team. She was with that Lang. Makes sense. That makes but sense. I, but I've heard that she didn't really have a lot of time uh, alone with Lang Ping. It's not like when she toured Lang Ping, she gets to. I think they had like two dinners together. Uh, but she was just observing Lang Ping sitting next to her uh, for a month, you know, touring with the team and also learning volleyball from some other coaches, you know, in the national team. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other particular things you want to talk about? Any particular struggles or disappointments or obstacles in terms of getting the film made or getting the film out there? It's been a huge hit in China. Uh, I haven't followed where else it's played. It, it, uh, it will have, a, I think, a very limited theatrical release in the U.S. And, and obviously is the Oscar submission it will be on the Academy screen room, which gives access to lots of people, 9,000 people to watch it. Is there anything you would say about this process that has been particularly challenging for you as a filmmaker? Each film usually comes with this bag of goodies and baddies. <laughs> it's a lot of challenges throughout, but the, um, the process of making the movie was, was so incredibly smooth. Uh, not without challenges, though, because every single turn, like I said, if you make this film with, in, in Hollywood, you wouldn't be able to do it because uh, the studio needs to be 100 percent sure that everything is going to be smooth. And when we were walking into, you know, in, when we were getting into production, everything was so uncertain, but everything turned out well. Uh, you know that we had the national team, which was a blessing, but we only had them for nine days. Mm -hmm. And um, in that nine days, we had to shoot the match with Brazil. And then that match alone should, should have taken more than nine days. And we shot that match in three days. And then we shot all the other scenes with the, I mean, when I said the national team, that means the second half of the movie. We shot the rest of the scenes with all the players in five days. So That's it was really fun. difficult. Yeah, oh, sorry. Where did you find the Brazilian and American and you know all the other international players? They're all they're actually all real national team players. I mean, the the American team players. One of them, uh, uh, Logan Tom, actually uh, played the match in in two thousand eight mm -hmm. in Beijing. 
she was Long Ping's uh, protege uh, uh, in the in the 2008 uh, U.S. team, and the Brazilian team three of them actually played the real match in Rio. So they're really reenacting not just the Chinese team but also the Brazilian team uh, and um, the U.S. team. And even the Japanese team, we got a couple of uh, a national team, uh, Japanese national team uh, players that that just retired from from uh, from the national team. So we've they're all real volleyball players, and even cameos like the Thai teams. We flew the whole Thai teams uh, to China uh, for like one quick little montage. So here we are shooting a sports movie with a director that don't know anything about volleyball. <laughs> and um, and uh, we were figuring out how to shoot volleyball with the DPs and with all the camera operators, how to capture all the movements. And we we were, you know, we were learning as we go. So we shot three matches of volleyball, and every single match we we got better and better and better. And we got more cameras and more cameras and more cameras. You know, from four cameras to six cameras to twelve cameras. Wow. And um, you know, this is unheard of, you know, because if, if you work on a film like this in Hollywood, you would have to plan everything. But if you plan everything, you wouldn't be able to do it, you know, because there's no way you could you could you could plan everything ahead and actually ended up with with what we've got. Mm -hmm. but, but somehow uh, we, we made it with this film. And, and I think that's that's that in itself was was really incredible. Well, it really is quite a feat for on a number of levels. So congratulations and best of luck, of course, in the upcoming Oscars. It's 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 always a tough season, you know. But uh, obviously, so one of the biggest uh, hurdle at the end was when we were getting ready to release the film in January, which the film was supposed to be released in January twenty fifth. And we went through the whole premiere and and whatnot, you know, on the 17th to the 19th and showing it to like over 10,000 people on different premieres in China. And and then I just wrapped and went back to Hong Kong for my Chinese New Year holiday. When I landed in Hong Kong, I got a phone call and said, you know, the film was postponed because the cinemas are going to be closed. So we're not going to release the film. So we was, I was sitting from... January 21st, uh, 22nd to um, September, wondering when the film is going to be released. So ultimately, the film was released in September, uh, supposedly worldwide, but technically, uh, you know, wherever cinemas were open and very rarely people get to see it in a cinema. Now that with the Academy Screening Room, and, and with everything that we're doing now. So I hope people could see it online. Uh, a lot of people actually get to see them online, uh, but not technically in the cinemas. But they did see it in the cinema when the film opened in um, late September, early October. Where, where many of us are very, very envious about how packed the movie theaters in China are. Yeah. Our, our theatrical business has been decimated. I know. For the time being. And uh, yes, so there's that too a whole other conversation. I want to pose some questions from audience members, if okay. you don't mind. Um, one of them is from someone named Clint Wu. Is there a story that you'd like to explore that you haven't yet had the opportunity to, to tell? Uh, yes, I, you know, I always uh, come up with, uh, you know, something, new and uh, I'm in the middle of uh, working on a script for my next project uh, and I, I think it should be it would be mo a more personal film you know having made two sports movies uh, back to back uh, one about volleyball and the other one about tennis which is yet to come out uh, I really have a yearning to go back to make something that is smaller and something that is very very personal uh, about my own relationship with with uh, myself and people around me, and uh, and and I think that uh, after having made a lot of uh, bigger movies in the last last fifteen years uh, working in China, I really want to do something that is just for me, just for myself. 
and um, which I haven't done so in a long, long time. So mm-hmm. that's going to be my next project. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, many people will be waiting with bated breath about that. Um, from Simon Chu. Hello, Simon. We, we asked whether you think that Asian cinema can never go global. Why has there never been a Chinese film which has won an Academy Award? Barely any have ever been nominated, just very few. And what is preventing this from happening? And I, I think Asian cinema has gone global already, you know, uh, and it's not like Asian cinemas are not seen. Uh, with, you know, since, the, I mean, particularly Chinese cinemas uh, from the 80s, you know, we've seen a lot of great Chinese auteurs, fifth generation directors telling very Chinese stories that has been seen all over the world. But the thing is, uh, I think the world is pretty much, um, especially with streaming, and the world is pretty much, um, in a way, homogenized um, because I think the gaps are really bridging. Maybe not so much in terms of Hollywood blockbuster, but um, but I'm sure that uh, but even Hollywood blockbusters, there are more and more Chinese characters. And, uh, but I think that, you know, with last year's um, Parasite, uh, it's such, it's a Korean movie. It won not only best foreign film, but uh, best international feature, but, but best picture. Uh, and, I, and I think that because the problems of the world and the societies are becoming more and more similar uh, wherever you are. You know, the same problems that is happening to people in L.A. or New York are the problems that are happening to people in Hong Kong or Beijing or Seoul or Tokyo um, or Bangkok. So I I think that our stories are being more and more similar. And uh, it's just the habit of people watching them in foreign language and reading subtitles. And, and I think that... Streaming certainly helps because uh, you've got more, you've got more, the decision, uh, it's less costly for the audience to go watch a foreign film. Uh, You don't have the cost of time, of traveling, of scheduling. You can just click on your TV and watch. And sometimes when you don't catch the subtitles, you can always pause and rewind and go back and watch it again. Uh, to me, I really think that when you click on one of these streaming platforms and then you watch, a lot of shows are in foreign languages. And uh, I watch more foreign language shows than I watch English language shows or Chinese language shows. So I think the world is really bridging nicely uh, in terms of of the entertainment materials that we get to watch or the content that we get to watch on, on the streaming platforms. So I, for one, is all for the streaming platforms because it, it's helping to bridge the world. It's helping us to get more uh, freedom for audience to watch, watch uh, things that they normally wouldn't choose. Um, for that alone, I think I'm, I'm a big supporter uh, an advocate of streaming platforms. I understand that for a lot of people, uh, for the diehard cinephile, that they believe that streaming is different from going to a cinema. But but I but I think um, they could coexist, and and I think that if it helps uh, to bridge and expand foreign films into into international market, I, I'm all for it. I couldn't agree more that the old business model of having to gather as many bodies in one place at the same time and open weekend definitely favors a certain kind of movie, you know, once it's sort of more of a mass appeal. But if there, there's so many wonderful uh, films to be seen from anywhere in the world and all the, you know, there's, there's the flattening of of the playing field, I think has been very, very good for more inclusive, diverse entertainment for sure. On the other hand, the experience of seeing something, I don't know if movie theaters will survive or how they'll survive in this country. So, you know, I love the idea of seeing movies in a theater, 
still. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. And, and, and I do hope that there are screens for perhaps very large movies, but also for smaller ones where it's like going to a museum or going to a cafe and, you know, a coffee shop where you have this very, very special experience. And it remains to be seen. But China, China is such a, is, it is so unusual in, in such a, a positive way, both because uh, the way that the economy is able to really, you know, just thrive at this point, and because people are able to go out into the world and, and be in cinemas, it will be, in, in, and China was already going, in my opinion, going down its own path in terms of the kinds of movies that have been very, very popular there. So it's a really a market unto itself. Mm. Uh, I, I appreciate the question because many of these very, very popular movies don't really uh, get, gather the same audience, you know, as, as they do in China. And at some point, hopefully that will change because there are so many movies that have done, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of business in China. Many of them have been yours and they don't get the attention that, that um, they would outside of China. So, and Yeah. One of the very uh, interesting phenomenon in China in the last few years is it's very hard for filmmakers to catch up because the obvious, uh, the movie that obviously would be a blockbuster um, usually uh, underperform. And uh, the bigger the stars, the bigger the budget doesn't mean the bigger the box office. Uh, It probably means the bigger the opening weekend but the thing is, it doesn't mean that it's going to be, you know, the uh, the winner at the end. Uh, usually, the opening weekend uh, numbers uh, is not uh, indicative of the end result of the film in China. Uh, this ticketing platforms uh, have a have a rating system uh, that comes from uh, ticket buyers who have seen the film. And they would rate the film and their rating ended up determining the outcome of the, uh, of the, uh, the final box office. And most of the times the final box office, office winners are dark horses that you never expect to win. Mm. And, and I think that trend in China, it actually has become a trend. It's, 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 a, it's a scenario that I have not seen anywhere else in the world. So spending a lot of PNAs, spending a lot of movie stars and on budget to make blockbuster is not a sure win. And that helps to, um, uh, to encourage investors uh, to bet on films that are not exactly right there in the middle. Uh, and I think that gives young filmmakers a lot of uh, uh, freedom to explore. Uh, but however, it's it's almost like democracy in a way. It doesn't mean that, uh, for me personally, it doesn't mean that most of these films that en- ended up breaking out of the box and became the biggest box office winners are not necessarily films that I like. Sometimes there are films that I, I, I totally dislike. But however, who am I to judge what is good and what is bad? It's really the audience who gets to judge them. So I think in that true sense, it's uh, on, the, on the theatrical uh, pattern, it's, it's almost like um, it's, it's real democracy, mm-hmm. you know, where the audience really ended up getting to choose. And I, and I think that aspect in China is, it's very strange. And I think it, it would probably, it probably would take Hollywood executives to, to study them and to, to understand what it means. And maybe it could be, it could be adapted uh, all over the world. Well, it is interesting. I think what you're saying is that because of the advanced ticket sales, the, the audience become like critics early on. They, they're almost yeah. helping dictate the box office. And, and yeah, the, and because so many ticket sales are the advanced ticket sales, it really yeah. influences how, many, how long the movie can stay in the theater. That goes very well, and that's very, very different from what I think most people would assume were, you know, just again the big blockbuster versus indie. I have noticed that very indie-minded type movies. For instance, um, you know, I invited Xu Zheng over a year or two ago, and and um, well, Bushi Yao Shen, you know, uh, yeah. Dying to Survive. 
very indie spirited movie, but made something like four hundred fifty million dollars. And that kind, that exact movie, that that same premise storyline here would be considered again an indie movie, Dallas Buyers Club, or whatever. And we'd, we'd have a limited audience. So it is very encouraging, actually, because they, I think, Chinese audiences really embrace films with social themes, so and and um, talking that have good talking points. You know, it's not necessarily they clearly embrace also Hollywood movies that with a lot of uh, visual effects and whatnot because for the novelty. But the movies with with strong social themes, like the movie that you produced, Better Days, is another one. It it pulls no punches. It's a very grounded movie and but very very powerful and uh also did incredible business so yeah in some ways the the tastes in china are more varied you, you, they accept many more kinds of movies and that's also very very enviable <laughs> it's a great thing you see it's, as you see 90 percent of the tickets that are, that are being purchased are the advanced sales I and mean, okay. people don't go to the cinemas to to pick what film they're going to watch anymore they just they just pick the film from from friends or from the website's recommendations because of uh, movie critics that are really just audience mm -hmm. you know they decide what film should work and what film shouldn't mm -hmm. and and that is that is very encouraging and social media of course is rampant there and yes. and there's a lot very very strong word of mouth yeah, it's one of the days where it makes sense to spend, you know, tons of money on advertising. So, yeah, yeah, all very fascinating, very fascinating. I, I feel that in so many ways, China has has trends that that are ahead of the curve, you know, that we will perhaps follow behind. Um, I, I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to combine two questions from two different people. And it's about casting. And what do you look for in actors? And is it different casting in different countries? So there, there are several questions around casting and, and you know, I'm, I'm sure some of these come from actors who are hoping to be in your movies. Uh, well, being, you know, working in the industry, casting, you always want to try to cast movie stars as much as you can. Uh, but however, casting movie star blindly just because they're movie stars is going to kill your film. It's going to hurt the film. So what I've tried to do all my life when I was casting with big names that I work with, the, I try to have very, very long conversations with them and try to understand uh, who they are, who they really are, and try to bring out the side of uh, some aspects of the movie stars uh, or from their own life, draw from their own life experience that audience would not know of um, and try to magnify them and write them into the script. So I like to improvise a lot. I, I don't um, lock my script down until I have an actor or an actress, and then I would work with them and understand and draw from the experience and actually put their experience into the script as much as I can. So, they, so the audience could see a side of them that they've never seen before. Um, so that has proven to be, uh, uh, I hate to use the word formula, but that has proven to me to be a way of working with actors that makes my actors different in my films than, 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 you know, than the persona they've been portrayed before, um, it's often very, very uh, uh, effective for me uh, with Leon Lai in Comrades, with uh, even with Zhao Wei in Dearest. So I've often worked with actors or with Huang Xiaoming in American Dreams in China. So all those are, uh, after you're having in-depth conversation with your actors, you, can, you could make them feel comfortable and you could make them grow into the character or the character would borrow from the lives. So that's, that's what I do. But with Leap, it's completely different. With Leap, it's uh, other than Gong Li and Huang Bo. Huang Bo, yeah. Exactly. It's are, always so great to watch, yeah. They're all amateur actors. They've never acted in their lives. And don't ask me how I pulled, pulled that off. 
Uh, <laughs> I don't remember how I pulled it off. It was really difficult. And it's the first time that I actually uh, uh, work with, uh, uh, have a acting coach on set. Because uh, I'm not an actor. I'm, I, you know, I've never studied acting. There's no way that I actually could work with amateur actors and, and teach them how to act. Mm -hmm. I could only tell, I can only tell them what I want and what I need. And I can say yes or no, but I can't, I won't be able to teach them how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I actually had one of, you know, it was, it was, he was a great, uh, acting coach from uh, from the Central uh, Film Academy, uh, Drama Academy. And uh, that is a new experience for me too. Mm. Sometimes working with non-professionals, I found it's more about telling them not to act. That like people yeah, have like this <laughs> what acting is, you know, <laughs> it's about how not to act. And yeah, no, that they, they were so authentic. I mean, Granted, a lot of the time they were playing, so that's something they obviously know how to do, but but there was never a false moment coming from anyone. So that that is yet another feat. Peter, I think our time is up, but there's so yes that well, let me leave with one note. They were so authentic that I was worried for a while that it would make our actors uh, look like actors. Mm because they're so real that no matter how good Gong Li and Huang Bo is, they're still acting. Mm -hmm. But the others are not acting, you know, they're real. Yeah. Well, it was very seamless, you know. I, and honestly, Gong Li, because she is so well disguised, if you've never seen her look like that, yeah. it didn't, it, it wasn't, sometimes in movies, the star will pop, you know, you like, oh, that is yeah. that person. And even Huang Guo, I thought he blended in perfectly. Um, so, yeah, well, congratulations again. Good luck. Um, I hope people see this in large numbers. And uh, we're so happy to have you featured on this program and to support you and so much of what you've done. Truly, you've had an extraordinary career. I know you, you also, you told me you've been staying at home with your family this entire time. So you have a, a rich family life too. And COVID has prevented you from traveling to China to promote your film, which is very sad. But um, but thank you for all you do for filmmakers. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yeah.